<clears throat> we've been, uh, over the past few weeks, looking at the background of the Apostle Paul. And this evening we're going to be looking at Silas and Timothy as well. And this is all keying off of 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, where we learn that it was Paul and Timothy and Silas or Silvanus, same guy, that were the three that had gone in to Thessalonica and ministered the word to them. You can turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> and this is where we left off last time. And we had just, in Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas had just left the consul in Jerusalem. And they had gone there, just to recap briefly, to endeavor to resolve this dispute that had arisen in the church concerning keeping the law and being circumcised. Because Paul and Barnabas were out there moving the word and sharing with people the revelation that was not necessary, that Jesus Christ had fulfilled that, there was no need for people to still be under the law, and there was no need to get circumcised. And yet then some were coming from Jerusalem and contradicting them and telling people that they had to be. And so they went and had this big meeting to settle this. And as a result of that meeting, they were all in agreement. And they sent letters with Paul and Barnabas to the believers in Antioch and the other places where they would travel, telling them that they were all in agreement that there was no need to be under the law, there was no need to be circumcised. And along with the letters that they sent by the hand of Paul and Barnabas, they also sent two men, Silas and Judas. Judas, how do you say his name? I think it just says Judas and Silas. Yeah. Judas Barsabbas, or something. It's so close to Barabbas, that's why I'm just always reluctant to say it. Um, at any rate, these two were sent out to say that, yes, the letters that Paul has with him, he didn't make that up. He didn't just write this down himself. He didn't just say, okay, I had a big meeting, and man, look, see, I got this letter. They sent these two men that were well-known, respected by everybody, that everybody would know, that would say, yes, this happened, what these guys are telling you is true, and that should settle the matter. So after they come to Antioch, and they do this, <clears throat> then Judas returns back to Jerusalem, and Silas stays with Paul. And that's how we begin to become introduced to Silas. This event is the first time Silas is mentioned. And this is when Silas now begins to become Paul's traveling mate. We're going to see how that all goes down. <clears throat> so we'll pick it up in Acts 15, verse 34. Notwithstanding, <clears throat> it pleased Silas to abide there, and there is Antioch. Antioch. Antioch is one of those <clears throat> great centers of learning, one of those big important cities. There was Alexandria in, in Egypt and Antioch in Syria. Those were the two hot spots. You know, it was there New York City and LA. Okay? <laughs> this was, these were the big cosmopolitan cities. So they're a place where a lot of people are. Antioch. <clears throat> Verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. Verse 36. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. So, <clears throat> this is some days. It doesn't say how many days. It's just some days. It doesn't say some years but it says some days. There's a short period of time that they're in Antioch, and then Paul says to Barnabas, let's make another trip. 
They've made one big trip, Paul's first itinerary, before the council in Jerusalem. Now they're be about to begin his second journey. And they're going to go, he wants to go and see everybody that they spoke the word to, see how they're doing. You know, Are you guys still standing strong? Are you still believing? They want to make sure that everybody's okay and communicate their love and, and get to see them. Verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, between Paul and Barnabas, that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus, and Paul chose who? Silas. 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 And departed being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So there's a disagreement here between Paul and Barnabas. When they're about ready to head out on the new journey, they disagree because Barnabas wants to take John Mark... We know that from one of the, the epistles. And they have a, a real argument about this. There's a real argument. It goes back and forth, and it says this contention was so sharp that it was like, okay, fine. You go your way, and I'm going my way. And so Barnabas departs with John Mark, and he goes to Cyprus. Cyprus was where um, Barnabas was from. So he's going back to his hometown. Now, Paul goes on his way, and that's really what the record follows. Some have concluded because of this disagreement, and because they go in separate directions, that, you know, that's the last you ever hear of Barnabas, and, you know, Barnabas was kind of, you know, tripped out, and, and that was, you know, a big mistake, and he's never heard of from him again. Well, <clears throat> since the record does follow Paul, you know, I think it's a fair conclusion to say it was a mistake. But to conclude from that, that Barnabas was all out in hog country and doing nothing worthwhile and all tripped out and never heard from again is not true. Um, he is heard from again. He's heard from in 1 Corinthians. Paul specifically says that you know, Barnabas and I have not, we only, you know, have, are we the only ones that don't have power to, to beat about a white and so forth. So he's talking about Barnabas. And John Mark is one of the guys who's there at the very end with Paul. When you read in Timothy, in the conclusion of 2 Timothy, he's one of the last guys standing with Paul. So, you know, sometimes people read more into this than they should. And you know, there's a lesson to be learned concerning what does happen here. Sometimes somebody might not make the best decision, but that doesn't mean that's the end of the story just because you make a bad decision at some point in your life. Just because you, you don't go the way that you should have, God's not done with you. you know? And if you have a heart to serve, then you'll find opportunities to serve. And Barnabas and John Mark did. Well, nonetheless, it's Silas who now becomes Paul's traveling mate. But there's something more that happens here at Antioch that I think is important to recognize, and I believe it plays a direct bearing on this record as well. 
And you'll see that in Galatians chapter 2. It's also more of the story about Silas. He's mentioned it here in Galatians 2 as well. We'll pick it up in verse 9 where it's talking again about the Council of Jerusalem. And I want you to see this so that you can see the timing of these events. And when James, Galatians 2.9, and when James, Cephas, which is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision, only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I was forward to do so. I would have done that anyway. So. But when Peter, verse 11, now, I, I, we've read those last two verses before, but I read them again to show you how right on the heels of them leaving the Council of Jerusalem. Here they are. They have this big meeting, and everybody agrees. Yep, we're all with you. We all agree. This is the right thing. You don't need to be under the law. That's out of the way. <clears throat> the Gentiles have full access to everything. They no sooner settle this matter, so to speak, or it would seem that this event occurs. Verse 11. But when Peter was come to where? Antioch. Antioch. To Antioch. So they end the meeting. They go to Antioch. Paul, Barnabas, and the other two join them. And sometime while they're there, those some days, Peter comes to Antioch. Peter. He was come to Antioch. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them that were of the circumcision. This was what they had just settled, supposedly. And yet, Peter comes to visit them while they're still in Antioch. And, first day is there, and they say, Hey, Peter, we're going to have a nice meal. You know, everybody's going to be joining us. You know, you're sitting right there next to, you know, Antonio and, you know, um, who else? You've got to have a Greek name. Felicia. Huh? Felicia. Felicia. Um, Zorba. <laughs> You're right between Zorba and Tony there, okay? And Peter's like, yeah, fine. Glad to have, you know. And he sits there and he's happy to eat with everybody. But then the next day when it comes time for supper, and here come a couple of guys from Jerusalem. You know, here come, you know, I can't think of any Jewish names now. <laughs> So, you know, Saul's the only one I can think of, right? <laughs> He's got a couple, of, John? <laughs> a couple of guys from Jerusalem there, and then he has a problem. He goes in the other room. He, he won't eat with them. And so, <clears throat> Pete, so Paul confronts him. Verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Not only did Peter leave the table, but... Some of the other ones got up, and they also left the table because they didn't want to be eating with these Gentiles, with these dogs. Because, of course, Gentiles were considered unclean. Gentiles you couldn't sit and eat with under the law, but did the law still apply? Mm -hmm. That's what they agreed on, right? And it says in the latter part of that verse, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation or hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Here's Barnabas himself. Barnabas. Barnabas, who had gone with Paul to Jerusalem in the first place over this issue. Barnabas would have been there right with Paul when they were being taken and beaten over this issue. And now even Barnabas is getting sucked into this hypocrisy because what? All of a sudden he's questioning whether really it's okay to be with Gentiles? No. But he's concerned about what these guys from Jerusalem are going to think. They're concerned about what other people will think. They know what's right. 
Peter knows what's right. Peter was the first one that spoke the word to the Gentiles. He's the one who went to the household of Cornelius. He's the one who saw them speak in tongues as soon as they got born again. He knew there was no reason why they should be separate. He's the one who said, of a truth now, I perceive that God is no respecter of what? Persons. Here he is. He understands all. He knows the truth. He's the one that rehearses all that again at the Council of Jerusalem. And yet, out of fear, out of concern, what these others would think, he won't sit down and meet with them. And Barnabas, the same thing. It's such a lesson for everyone. Not just who you eat with. But it's such a lesson in terms of recognizing that we can't be concerned about what people think when it comes to standing on the truth of the word. It's the natural human tendency. And it's easy to rationalize, you know, well, I don't want to offend people, and, you know, I, I just want to be loving to them. I know that it's okay, but, you know, I want to be loving to these brethren from Jerusalem that don't quite get this yet. What was that loving to the Gentiles? To keep treating them like second class? Of course not. Of course not. But boy, we just have to stand on the truth no matter what anybody thinks. No matter what anybody thinks in every situation. Well, Paul did. Verse 14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? You don't follow the law anymore, Peter. So why do you want to put it on them? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Mm -hmm. And he goes on. goes on establishing, again, how clear it is that we are not justified by the works of the law. That's it. We're not justified by it. Well, he lets him have it. Stop there and go over to Timothy. Uh, well, okay, Acts chapter 16. That's the introduction to Silas in that event. In Acts chapter 16, we then get introduced to Timothy. Acts 16, verse 1. just left off there with Paul taking Silas and going through Syria and Cilicia in verse 41 and then chapter 16 verse 1. Then came he, Paul, to Derby and Lystra. Got a little hat there while he was in that place. <laughs> and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess and believed, but his father was a Greek. So we have Timotheus, who's also known as Timothy. We have Silvanus, who's also known as Silas. And, you know, with this, it's just different. They're named in different languages. Silvanus is the Latin of Silas. Timotheus is the Greek of Timothy. And so they're, no one has both of these different names, depending on just what context they're being written about. And it says that Timothy, we get a little information about this, that he is a certain disciple, it says at that point, and that he's a son of a certain woman, which was a Jewess. And he believed, but his father was a Greek. Um, I don't know if I've got it in my notes, if we're going to end up there or not. But So Timothy's mother is Eunice, and his grandmother, we learn, is named is Lois. And both of them are believers. But <clears throat> Timothy's father is a Greek. And it says he was a good man in some place, but he was a Greek. We 
which was well reported of, oh, there it is, by the brethren, which were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him, and took and did what? Circumcised him. Circumcised him. Because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. <laughs> and they went through the cities, and as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem. Those were the letters that we read about, right? The letters saying that they don't have to do what? Keep the law or get circumcised. Now, you know, I don't know, like, I, I, I'm thinking Paul probably let Timothy read the letter, you know? I don't think, like, he, like, while Timothy was sleeping one night and held him down and, you know, somebody else came along and did a little snipping on him. Hmm. Paul knew, and certainly we've seen, that Paul was not one to compromise. Paul knew that there was no need to circumcise. Timothy, I'm certain, since the letters are right there and they're sharing them with everybody, he knew as well. And yet, here you have it, he circumcises him. You know, in Galatians, flip back there, Galatians chapter 5, it gets even more interesting. We were in Galatians a minute ago. When you read in Galatians 5 about this business of circumcising, because not only do they have letters that say you don't have to be circumcised, but in Galatians, we have these verses where it tells us in Galatians 5 verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Boy, can you imagine Timothy reading that one? <laughs> Why did you do this to me, Paul? Now, now Christ is of no profit to me. You, you circumcised me, and now Christ is of no profit. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Poor Timothy. Now... Paul had him circumcised, and Christ is of no effect, and Timothy now is a debtor to do the whole law. Verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. So, poor Timothy, he's a debtor to the law, Christ is of no effect, and he's fallen from grace, all because Paul decided to do this. Well, what's the answer? Why did Paul do it? <clears throat> well, one of the great realities, one of the great things that you have to understand is it is not the act, but rather the motivation behind the act that often is what determines whether it's right or wrong. It is more the motivation behind an act than the act itself that determines whether it's right or wrong. Somebody cuts off your arm, is that good or bad? Yeah. It depends. Depends. Run. depends. Well, you're probably not happy about it no matter what, right? Yeah. But if it's a doctor that's doing it because there's gangrene in it, then it's a necessary thing, right? Yeah. So it's not an evil thing in that case, is it? No. Right. The motivation is to save your life, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's the motivation behind it. When Peter separated himself when the guys came from Jerusalem, his motivation was one out of fear, fearing the Jews, what they would think, how this would be affected. But that's not Paul's motivation. It wasn't Timothy's motivation in agreeing to a decircumcise. His motivation was that it would allow them, it would enable them to minister the word in places where otherwise Timothy would not be able to minister the word. Because he'd never, they would never even give him the time of day. They would never even listen to him long enough to understand what they were sharing. They would never begin to listen to understand that they were not under the law or there wasn't a need for circumcision. I believe it's also in Galatians where Paul, by revelation, wrote that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avail anything. You know, if you're circumcised, 
but your motivation wasn't to buy it, try to become righteous by your works, then you're not falling from grace. You know? That's good news for a lot of people in America you know, <laughs> that are circumcised for no particularly good reason. Um, myself. You know, it becomes less and less. It's like about 50-50 nowadays. It was, you know, when I was born, practically everybody. You know, well, that doesn't mean just because all the people in America thought that for whatever reason they wanted to go ahead and do it or have their son circumcised, that now, you know, their son is a debtor to do the whole law, that he's fallen from grace, and that Christ is of none effect to your poor son because you decided to have him circumcised, right? No, you didn't do it to try to earn his righteousness by that act, right? Okay. And that's the case with Timothy. Timothy didn't do it thinking that by that act he would in any way be more justified. Nor did Paul think that when he had him done. Nor was he doing it to, to just cave into pressure, but rather that this allowed him to move the word. And he did it with God's lead. We'll go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We'll learn a bit more here about Timothy. Let's go through this quickly to kind of wrap up Timothy, and then next week we'll get into Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, or 2 Timothy. Right. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Here, Paul's writing to Timothy, and he says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwell first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee, by the putting out of my hands. So, yes, yeah, there were, is that where we learned the names of his mother and grandmother, yes. and how Timothy was a man of genuine believing, just as his mother. Eunice and his grandmother Lois were also. And not only is he a man of genuine believing, but from verse 6 we learn that he is a man with a ministry. A man with a gift ministry. When Paul laid hands on him, there's only two reasons that you do that spiritually. One is for healing, identification with to, when you're receiving revelation to minister healing. And the other one is in ordination. And here it was for Timothy being ordained. He was a man with a ministry, a man who, because of that ministry, needed to be able to minister that word all over the world. And in 2 Timothy chapter, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, no, 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 18, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. The prophecies at the time that Paul laid his hands on him, the prophecies concerning that gift ministry. And in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, in verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given me thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, the elders. That ties those other two verses together. So this is Timothy. Paul had met him on the first itinerary. He joined Paul on the second one when he got to Derby, And he, along with Silas, then, are the two that go with Paul throughout that second journey they will be the ones that go into Thessalonica, which we'll look at next time.